fighting till the day I die. Um, Isaiah 41, look at verse 10. We're going to read several, uh, all the way down to verse number 21. We're starting in verse 10. Ready? Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shalt not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shitta tree and the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the King of Jacob. I want to talk to you about this, this thought tonight. Produce strong reasons reasons produce strong reasons in verse 21 it says produce your cause saith the lord bring forth your strong reasons saith the king of jacob let's pray together heavenly father <clears throat> thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening thank you lord for every person that took time to come to church tonight i pray you bless them lord those that are watching online, once again, please bless them. Dear God, we need you, Lord. We need you tonight. Our country's in desperate, desperate need of you. And I pray, Lord, for a sweeping revival to sweep our nation. I pray that the election's not totally decided yet, Lord. And we ask you to put the person in, in power as president that you want, that you feel is necessary for us, whatever it might be. We'll give you the glory for what you'll do. At this time during this church service, Holy Spirit of God, I yield myself to you and I ask you to fill me with your power. I ask you, Lord, for the mind of Christ. I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. If there's anybody among us that needs to get saved, Lord, help them to get saved tonight. If there's anybody that needs to be baptized, Lord, help them to get baptized tonight. Please, God, do a work that only you can do and we'll give you all the glory for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage of Scripture, God was coming to Jacob, which is a name that God referred to Israel, because Jacob uh, was the name of Israel before God changed his name to Israel. But often when God would refer to his people as Jacob, he would, uh, he, he would say, uh, because they weren't living right. And if you look down at... Uh, at verse number, oh, let's see here. We just read it. Uh, verse number 14. God says, fear not, thou worm, Jacob. Um, uh, 
Aiden, can, can you, th thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Um, it says, fear not, thou worm, Jacob. In other words, Israel was not acting like they were supposed to act. They were not spiritual. They, they were not right with God. And God looked at his people, and he referred to them as a worm. And then he said, ye men of Israel. And then here's what God said. I'm going to help you, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. By the way, you know why God's called thy Redeemer or our Redeemer? Because we need to be redeemed. Because there's something wrong. Amen? I mean, if we're all perfect on our way to heaven, why did Jesus die on the cross and shed his blood to pay for our sins? He died on the cross because that's our only hope of going to heaven. And then there's sometimes when we're just simply not living right and we're not doing the things that God wants us to do, and God says you need to get redeemed, not from hell per se, but from the mess you're in. And, uh, and that's why God referred to them. But verse number 10, and by the way, this whole passage is not to an individual, it's to the nation of Israel. This whole passage that we've just read is God speaking to the nation, specifically his people. And in verse number 10, he said, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. He was pleading with Israel to get right with him. He was offering his assistance. He was telling them, what he would do for them. God came to Israel as a nation and said six things. Letter A, he said, fear thou not. You know, one of the things that I hate about this coronavirus and one of the things I hate about these mandates and all that we're doing in our country is we're living in a state of fear. You know, everywhere we, I, it just breaks my heart as I drive down the road and I just see people, you know, with masks on their face. You know, everywhere. I mean, just everywhere. And it's just so sad. Um, my son and I went to Subway tonight and, uh, to, to, to get some food. <clears throat> Everybody in there is wearing a mask. And as we were getting ready to walk up to the door, you know, Jack goes, should we put a mask on? I said, no, let's just go, let's just go get some food and leave. And um, nobody said a word to us. No, no, <laughs> it was unusual, but nobody gave us mean looks or anything like that. The, the, the employees were fine. And, you know, but it's just ridiculous, the fear that we live in right now. I mean, we're just so afraid, so afraid. I love what President Trump said. He says, we've got to learn to live with it. If Biden is our next president, remember what he said during the debate? We've got to learn to die with it. It's totally different. Totally different approach. I'm not looking at coronavirus saying, all right, when am I going to die because of it? No, I, I just want to live. I want to live, and I'm going to live through it. i got to learn to live with it. And, uh, and, and <clears throat> I just think that uh, we got a backwards philosophy. But God said to his people, Israel, and said to the nation, Fear thou not. He said, don't live your life in fear. Don't be afraid of all what's happening around you and of the devil and all that's going on. So the first thing he said in verse number 10 is fear thou not. Then, letter B, write this down. God is with us. God is with us. He said to the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, for I am with thee. You know what? You don't have to be afraid if God is in your life. And we don't have to be afraid as a society if God is welcome in our society. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. Uh, our society is wanting to push God out and kick God out more and more all the time. But listen, Hopewell Baptist Church, God is with us. We don't have to be afraid. We got the promise that God is with us. God will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. The Bible says he'll not fail us. And as long as we are right with him, everything is going to be just fine. I'm not saying that we're not going to have problems. I'm not going to say we're not going to have disappointments or challenges. You know, one preacher said to me recently, what did we think was going to happen right before the rapture? Was it just going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy? Is it just going to be, hey, everything is smooth sailing? Oh, the rapture. No, the rapture takes place when everything is terrible. When things are just like out of control. When Jesus comes back, he says, shall I find faith on the earth? Why did he ask that question? Because faith is going to be in such small supply. Very few people on the earth, percentage-wise, will be living by faith. So the fact of the matter is, hey, I don't, look, if the election doesn't go the way we want it, it just means we're closer to the rapture. 
Come on, man. I'd rather get out of here. Bill, we're going to go through the tribulation period. Oh, man, come on. You don't understand Bible prophecy. We are already in the great tribulation. It started back in A.D. 70, A.D. 70, all the way through now, 2,000 years of tribulation. What we are not going to be a part of is the day of the Lord, that seven-year period where the wrath of God is poured out on this planet. We get raptured before that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The wrath of God is not for his children. The wrath of God is for the unsaved, wicked world. And he's going to rapture us out just like God put Noah on the ark before the flood came. And wiped out all the people that did not believe in God. Well, that's the same thing. God says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He's going to rapture us out first, just like he put Noah in the family, his family in the ark, shut the door. Then the flood came. Well, he's going to rapture us out, and then the wrath is going to fall. And I'm going to tell you right now, though, as long as God's with us, no matter what goes on around us, we'll be just fine. God, Fear thou not, God is with us. Let her see, write this down, be not discouraged. Be not discouraged. I would hate to think somebody didn't come to church tonight because they're discouraged with what happened with the election. You know, it's kind of like being discouraged about coronavirus. Again, when things are bad, that's when we need God. That's when we need to go to church. That's when we need to pray. That's when we need to get a hold of the throne of God. In verse number 10, it says, fear thou not, for I'm with thee. Then it says, be not dismayed. That word dismayed is synonymous with with our word discouraged. So here's what God says. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't be discouraged. Letter D. God said that he would strengthen us. Look at verse number, number 10 again. Fear thou not, for I'm with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Look what it says. I will strengthen thee. I will strengthen thee. Now, listen carefully. Listen carefully. What do you get strength for? Because you're about to do something. You need no strength if this is what you're doing. Ah. (sighs) Just sitting around, not doing anything at all. Why would God strengthen a Christian who's doing nothing? Why would God give his strength to someone who's not going to use it? So here's what God says. I've got a job for you to do. I want America. This is, um, you know, we're learning from how he dealt with Israel, how God's dealing with America. I want to help this nation, he said. So I'm going to give you the strength you need to do what it is I'm going to tell you to do. So listen, sometimes you say, well, I just don't know if I can do what needs to be done. If you're operating in your own strength, well, then that's valid. But God says, if you do what needs to be done, I'm going to give you strength. If you just look back one chapter to Isaiah 40, 31, that famous verse, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That word wait upon the Lord, that phrase wait upon the Lord doesn't mean sit in a chair waiting for God to show up. That word uh, phrase wait upon the Lord means to serve the Lord, being a waiter, waiting upon the Lord, saying, God, can I take your order today? What would you like me to do? When you live for God and serve him, he says, I will provide the strength. I'll renew your strength. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and you'll not faint. So God said to Israel, fear thou not. I'm with you. Don't be discouraged. I'll strengthen you. And then look what it says. I love this. It says, uh, fear thou not, for I'm with thee. Be not dismayed, for I'm thy God. I will strengthen thee. Watch this. Yea, I will help thee. I will help thee. You know what God says here? He says, let her eat. God will help us. What does that mean? There are certain things in life that you and I cannot do. That only God can do. And you know what God said? I'll do it. I'll help you. I'll come down and take care of it. I'll do what you need me to do. I'll do what you want me to do. Again, wants and needs, is, you know, we can want to be rich, but that's not always what God wants us to be, right? So the fact of the matter is, though, God says, I'll help you. I'm so glad I've got God as my helper. I'm so glad that I don't have to look at life when I see things that I cannot control and that I cannot figure out and that I cannot solve. There's a God in heaven who can. You see, God taught us that all through the Bible. The feeding of the 5,000. The disciples came to Jesus, and Jesus said, hey, I've been preaching for hours. By the way, I preach a lot shorter than Jesus preached. 
So don't you ever think I preach long sermons, all right? So Jesus preached for hours. And then he said, uh, we can't send them home or else they'll faint in the way. Now, why would Jesus say that? They're going to faint in the way. That literally means they're going to be walking home and they're not going to make it before they pass out because they don't have food. That means he preached practically the whole day. They came out to hear him preach, and it was just a long day that he was preaching. He says, we got we to feed them. And, uh, and uh, Thomas comes up to him and says, well, if we had 500 penny worth of bread, what is that among so many? I mean, how are we going to feed all these people? We don't have any food. And he says, all we got is this little boy brought a sack lunch, five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus says, that's all I need. Give me what you have, and I'll do what only I can do. And God took those five loaves and two fishes and fed probably fifteen to 20,000. It was 5,000 men, and it's said in the Bible, besides women and children. And most of you know that if you understand the Bible days, most men got married, not everyone, but most of them did, and they didn't stop with 1.75 children. They had their quiver full. They would have as many kids as the Lord would bless them. So it's safe to say there was fifteen to 20,000 people at this gathering to hear Jesus preach, and he took five loaves and two fishes. No, yeah, yeah, that's right, five loaves and two fishes. And there were pieces, five pieces of bread and two small fishes, and he multiplied it, fed the thousands, and had 12 baskets full that remained. You know what? God can do that. You and I can't. You and I can't, but God can. And here's what God said to Israel. I'll help you. I'll do what only I can do. You just get right with me, and I'll show up. I'll do what you need me to do. And then lastly, letter F, this is all introduction, by the way. He said, write this down if you're taking notes, God will lift us up in his righteousness. In verse 10 it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Then he said this, Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. What he said was, I'm going to lift you up based on what I think is right. So listen very carefully. If we want God to rescue America, if we want God to help America, if we want God to save America, he's going to do it his way. It's according to his righteousness. So you know what you and I need to get on board with? We need to get on board with what God says is right. Not what the world says is right. Not what you and I think is right. But what he thinks is right. Because he's going to lift us up and he's going to hold us up based on his righteousness. That means he will never compromise right in order to help us. He will never compromise what truth is in order to to help us succeed or to help us to be salvaged. Now listen carefully. We as Christians can have a significant role in our nation. Do you really want that? You know what's easy to do? It's easy for us as Christians to say, you know what? We concern ourselves with the things of God. The non-Christians can concern themselves with our government. Well, that's what we've had happen for far too long. And now that we've had Christians who basically said, you got to separate church from state, what? I'm sorry. It's nowhere in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Declaration of Independence. It's nowhere in the Constitution. There's nothing in our United States Constitution that says Christians can have nothing to do with government. It's ridiculous. But yet the devil has sold us that lie. Listen to me. Do you really want God to save America. How do you think he's going to do it? He's going to do it through us. We as Christians can have a significant role in our nation. We must, listen to this carefully, produce strong reasons for God to change America. You know what now is, 2020, in more ways than one? It's a wake-up call. If we are not going to wake up to the evil to all that's happening in our nation right now, then just put a fork in us, we're done. I mean, if we don't wake up in 2020, we're never waking up. If we don't look at our elections and say, this is really not good, the direction our country is going. This is really scary because God's about ready to rain fire and brimstone down from heaven and, just, and wipe out America. 
I believe that with all my heart, just like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. If we do not wake up now, let me t when are we ever going to wake up? Let me give you two verses by way of introduction, and then I'm going to give you five points tonight. Look at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. If more preachers in America would preach like I'm preaching right now, maybe we wouldn't be going through what we're going through right now. Romans chapter 13. A bunch of con-promising preachers afraid to offend the flock. I got people getting mad at me all the time. I got people who won't come back to this church anymore because they're mad at what I post on Facebook. These are people I led to the Lord. How retarded is that? Getting mad at a, at a joke on Facebook or a political position that I take on Facebook and they're not going to come back to the, to the church over that? You know, there, there are preachers that are so scared to stand up and tell the truth that some of their church members won't come back that, that they, they never say, thus saith the Lord. They never get up and just preach it like it's supposed to be preached. But I ain't going to live that way. Romans 13, look at verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting. Whoa. Did God actually say not in rioting? Whoa. Anybody that's engaged in rioting in downtown Denver, you need to get right with God. Okay, let's continue here. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ to make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Verse 11 says, knowing the time, it's, n it's now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Let's look at one more verse, and then I'll give you the outline. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, please. 1 Peter chapter 4. There's nothing wrong in our society that good old-fashioned Bible preaching couldn't cure. God's Word has the answers to everything. We just need churches and preachers to proclaim the Word of God. That's what we need. You want to see a scary verse? All right, here we go. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. You know when God judges America, you know where he's going to begin? Churches like Hopewell. This is where judgment's going to begin. All the churches in our nation, that's where it's going to start. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Now watch this. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of, the, of them that obey not, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? All right, so here's what God says. The judgment of America is going to begin at the house of God. And if, if you think that's scary, you know, God says, wait till I deal with those that don't even believe in me, the unrighteous, those who hate me. I'll get them too. But God says judgment of a nation always begins at the house of God. So listen to this very carefully. We need, if we're going to have God rescue us from what's going on in this country, if we're going to have any kind of revival, if we're going to have any kind of, of, a, of, of a spiritual awakening, we need to produce some strong reasons for God. You know, every once in a while, people just say, <coughs> well, why, why, why doesn't God just save America because he loves us? Let me ask you a question. How many people on planet Earth does God love? Every one of us. Is there any one of us in the, in the world today that's going to die and go to hell? But God still loves them, right? So if God loves America, if God loves us, Obviously, that's not enough when it comes to saving America. If we're going to see America salvaged, we've got to produce some strong reasons. In fact, what God did to Israel is in um, Isaiah 41, he told them what he was offering them. And then he said in verse 13, I'm going to hold your right hand and, and, I'll, and fear not, I'm going to help you. 
And then he said in verse 17, uh, when the poor and needy seek water and there's none, he goes, their tongue fell for thirst. I, the Lord's going to hear them. The God of Israel, I'll not forsake them. So he, he, he offered all of this to Israel. And then he concluded by saying, produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. You know what God was saying? Here's what I'm making available to you as a nation. Now give me some reason to do it. You know what God is saying to Christians right now that are in this room? If every one of you would be listening to me and paying attention to me. He says, you want me to save America? He said, give me a reason. Give me a reason. And by the way, he said, produce, he says, your strong, you know, your cause and your strong reason. He says, give me, don't just give me a reason, like because. Do you know what because is? That's a weak reason. God up in heaven looks down at us. Why should I come down there and help you all out? Because. What? Because. What kind of reason is that? That's pathetic. Don't come to me and say, God, help me out. Because, just because, give me a strong reason. Let me give you five of them tonight. Five strong reasons. Look at Revelation chapter 2. Turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And look down, if you would please, at verse number 11. <coughs> Revelation chapter 2. I'm telling you what, I'm about tired of breathing all that smoke from the fires. Good night. I've been breathing it for so long. It's uh, and, and, and toppled with my allergies. <laughs> it ain't a co good combination. All right, Revelation chapter 2, look at verse number 11. Are you there? All right, look at verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Look at verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Number one, the first strong reason we can give to God to rescue us in this country. Number one, write this down. We will listen to God. We'll listen to him. In chapter 2, of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the churches. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. In verse 17, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know what God says? If you got an ear, would you listen to me? If you listen to me, then things can go so much better. And here's what it is. We are so distracted in our society. We got smartphones. We got laptops. We got television. We've got movies. We've got sports. We've got, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. We're not really, Christians are not really listening to God like we should. But if we go to God and we can convince him, God, would you come down and save America? God, would you rescue us from this mess that we're in? God says, all right, I can do it. I want to do it. Give me a strong reason. We can go to God and say, God, we'll listen to you. We'll listen to you. Now listen carefully. You don't have to be wealthy to listen to God. You don't have to be multi-talented to listen to God. All you have to do is be alive. All you've got to do is be his child. And whenever God says, okay, you want me to help you out? When I speak, listen to me. Give me your ear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. So one of the strong reasons that we can produce for God is this. God, whenever you speak, we're listening. I want you to speak to us. You know what? You know what? I thank God up in heaven. You know what he says? I think he feels this way. Why in the world would I speak to you? You're not going to listen to me anyway. You don't need me. You're doing everything on your own. You decide everything what you do on your own. If you feel like doing something, you do it. If you don't feel like doing something, you don't do it. You don't have any regard to me. We're talking about, you know, Christianity as a whole in America. And he says, why in the world would I even speak to you? All it'd be is one, in one ear and out the other. You and I know sometimes when I'm preaching, people are like this. 
sleeping while I'm preaching. Sometimes I'm preaching and we're doodling. Sometimes I'm preaching and we got our stinking face in a smartphone. Sometimes I'm preaching and the brain is just like daydreaming. Oh, oh, wow, whoa, oh, man, look at that. Wow, whoa. I didn't know all those fans were up there. Wow, the one, two, three, four, five blades and four. Wow, there's one, two, three, four, five fans. And wow, what? You, and the whole time I'm preaching. The whole time. You know what God says? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know what God says? Produce a strong reason, a good reason for God to intervene for us. Lord, we will hear you. We'll listen to you. Number two, look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. Go back to the Old Testament now. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter number 11, please. God is good. Deuteronomy chapter number 11, and if you would please look down at verse number 26. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter number 11. Look at verse number 26. Watch this now. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Ready? A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day to go after other gods, which you have not known. Number two, what's the second strong reason that we can give to God? Write this down. Number two, we will obey his voice and his word. We will obey his voice and his word. You know what God says? He goes, first of all, I want you to listen to me. You're never going to know what to do if you don't listen to God. You're never going to know what God wants in your life if you never open the Bible and read it. You'll never know what God wants you to do in life if you don't listen to the preacher while he's preaching the Word of God. And here's what God said to his people, Israel, as a nation. And he says it to us as America. He says, listen to me. I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. He goes, you want the blessing? Here's how you get it. If you obey the commandment of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, I will bless you. He says, but if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God and turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day, a curse. So you know what God says? Produce a strong reason. Here's a good reason for God to bless America, for God to salvage America, for God to redeem us, for God to help us. Ready? God, you, we'll listen to you. You tell us what, what you want us to know, and whatever you tell us to do, we will obey you. How are we doing with obedience? You know the average church member in America does? They hear the preacher the, preach the word of God, if he does preach the word of God at all. And they sit there and they go, hmm, I'm going to think about this. Not sure if I believe in this thing called tithy. It's not tithy, it's tithe. I'm not sure if I believe in this thing called faithfulness. I'm not sure if I believe in this thing called soul winning. I'm not sure if I believe that you really have to read your Bible and pray every day. You know, on, on and on and on. All the commands in the Bible, when God tells us to do something, he said, blessing if you obey, curse if you disobey and if we go to god and we just say god i'm not fooling around anymore if you tell me what to do yes sir i'm ready to go i'll do exactly what you say no more reasoning it out no more thinking about well this is a different age you don't need to be a hyper dispensationalist all these different dispensations of time god's the same yesterday today and forever the shadow of God never changes. I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Neither is there any variance in God, nor shadow of turning. What God believed in the Old Testament, he believed when Jesus walked on this earth. What Jesus believed when he walked on this earth, he, God still believes at the beginning of the church in the book of Acts. And what God believed at the beginning of the church in the book of Acts, he believes in 2020 for all of us to live by right now. And I have a sneaking suspicion he's going to believe the same thing as we go forward. God doesn't change. There are simple things that he wants us to do as Christians, people of faith. And he says, if you will obey me, that will inspire me to come down and help you out. 
So what's a strong reason that we can give God to help us out? By the way, this is going to take work. This is not just, we're going to pray one prayer. Dear God, please save America. Okay, can't wait for it to come. Here we go. You all ready? You ready? Here it comes. He's, we just asked. No, God says, I don't want you to just ask. I want you to listen. I want you to obey. Number three, look at Colossians chapter three. Go back in the New Testament now. We'll be done in just a few minutes. Give me five or ten minutes, we'll be done. Colossians chapter 3. By the way, if everybody's waiting all this time for the election results, you can wait a little bit longer for the service to end. <laughs> oh, Colossians chapter 3. I, we got to be done right now. Yeah, I'll tell that to the election people. I got to know right now who's my next president. What is that now? Yes. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> Preach it now. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. Ready? If ye then, being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Look what it says in verse 2. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Now listen very carefully. Verse number 2 does not say... You ready? It does not say set your affection on God. It says set your affection on the things above. Number three, write this down. Ready for this? You want to produce, you want God to help us save America, get us out of the mess we're in? All right, here's the third strong reason. We will care about the things of God. We will, God, if you'll do all that you said in verse 10, fear thou not, you'll be with us. We shouldn't be discouraged. You'll strengthen us, help us, and you'll lift us up by your righteousness. If you'll do all of that for America, here's the reason we're going to give you to do it. Number one, we're going to listen to you. Number two, we're going to obey you. Number three, we're going to start caring about the things of God. That means we're going to love church. We're going to love the Bible. We're going to love prayer. We're going to care about missionaries as they're going all over the world trying to spread the gospel. So we're going to care enough to give to help support the missionaries. We're going to care about lost souls getting saved. We're going to love the ministry. We're going to want to just be a part of everything that's above. Because here's what God contrasts it with. In verse number 2 of Colossians 3, he says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What are things on the earth? A car. A house money, television sets, material goods, clothing. These are all things of the earth. You know what God says? It's okay to have money and a house and a car and clothing and the thing, but just don't set your affection on it. Don't just be in love with your television set or in love with your car or in love with your house or in love with your uh, clothing or whatever your job, whatever the things of this earth. He says, set your affection on the things of God. And what are the things of heaven, the things of God? Some of it is church and, and some of it is the Bible and prayer and uh, ministry and souls being saved and missions going around the world. The things of God. God says, set your affection on it. You know what I feel like, you know what I think breaks God's heart more than just about anything? Is that there are things that God deeply loves and most of his children look at it like, what? Church? Don't, don't go to church too much now. Don't get too carried away. You know, don't get too carried away with missions. Don't get, don't get too ridiculous now was soul winning. And no, no, no. God up in heaven says, I love all of these things of heaven, things of God. And we need to share in that. God, I want you to save America. God, I want you to change the mess that we're in. Here's a strong reason. I'm going to start listening to you like I've never listened to you before. I know I've been distracted. I know I've been busy with my own things and my own life. But God, I'm going to listen to you from now on. Secondly, the second strong reason, Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I will obey without question, without hesitation. I don't even have to agree with it. You tell me what to do, and I will obey. Number three, I'm going to fall in love with the things of God. 
I'm actually going to love church and love Bible and love prayer and love soul winning and love ministry and love missions. I'm going to, I'm going to care about it. Number four, look at Ephesians chapter six. Just two books over to the left. Ephesians chapter six and verse number 10. Ephesians, a uh, very familiar verse. We've read this passage many times in recent months and years. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That means your enemy is not your neighbor. Your enemy is not a politician. Your enemy is not a human being. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But who do we wrestle against? Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places wherefore ready take unto you the whole armor of god that she may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore what's the fourth strong reason that we should give god to save america to rescue us from the mess that we're in number four write this down we will stand against evil we will stand against evil Listen to me carefully. You need, as a Christian, to stand against the darkness of this world. You know what we've done for, for too long as Christians? <laughs> we just mind our own business. We just want to be comfortable in our house. If people out there are doing evil, as long as it doesn't enter my house, I'm not going to say much about it. Who is going to stand for the millions of babies that are being aborted all over this country. You think the heathen are going to stand? You think those who don't believe in God are going to stand for the rights of our babies? Who's going to stand against corruption in our government? And believe me, there's corruption. And for anybody who thinks I'm naive, there's corruption on both sides. I'm not saying just the liberals are corrupt and the Republicans or conservatives or not, there's corruption on both sides, my friend. And it's our responsibility and it's our job as a Christian that loves America to call it out, to expose it, to shine a light on it. And then when the evil comes to us, we need to take a stand and say, I am not going to participate. I am not going to allow this to happen without a voice, without saying something about it, without fighting against the, wrestling against the um, principalities and the powers and the evil, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. God says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. You know what we need to do as Christians? We need to take a stand for God. There's an Old Testament illustration, and then I'll quickly go on to point number five, which is the last point. Moses came down to the children of Israel, and the man named Korah, K-O-R-A-H, led an uprising against Moses. He said, who do you think you are, Moses? You think you're the only one that can lead us? We can lead ourselves. We don't need to follow you anymore. We're going back to Egypt. And here's what Moses said. Moses said, all right, Korah, you had your speech. You've got your gathering. Here's what Moses did. He took a stick and he drew a line in the, in the dirt all the way across. And he just said this, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. The Bible says the sons of Levi came unto, unto Moses and Korah and his, his group opposed Moses and God, God used Moses said, Moses said, I'm going to give everyone a chance to make a stand. Are you with Korah or are you with me on the Lord's side? And those that came on the Lord's side were protected. And the Bible says the earth opened up and it swallowed Korah and his followers straight into the pit of hell. And then the ground closed up just like a mouth opening up and swallowing him and closing right back up. You know what we need to do right now in America? Draw a line in the sand. Who's on the Lord's side? Take a stand. Quit saying, well, you know, you know to each his own. 
and who am I to interfere with what goes on in your, the privacy of your own home? And who am I to say the government's wrong or corrupt? And who am I and who? No, take a stand. Take a stand for God. Get on the Lord's side. That's exactly what David did with Goliath. All those Israelite soldiers scared to death of this 10-foot tall soldier of the Philistines. David came along and said, somebody needs to shut him up. Someone needs to knock his block off. And they were all scared to death. He goes, I'll do it. Here's David, five foot eight, five foot ten, whatever he was, short, ruddy, redhead, uh, freckles on his face. And all he had was a slingshot and five smooth stones. And here's Goliath, a man of war for the Philistines, a champion of the Philistines, ten feet tall. But you know what he did? David took a stand. And that's what you and I need to do. Number five and last, look at Romans chapter 12. Last passage, last point, and then we'll wrap this sermon up. Romans chapter 12. This is what's going to save America. Don't forget, judgment begins at the house of God. Don't forget that. Romans chapter 12. We're going to read famous verses, familiar verses, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Number five and last. Our fifth strong reason that we need to give to God is this. Write this down, number five. We will dedicate our lives to serve God. We will dedicate our lives to serve God. God says right here, Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means don't be a dead sacrifice. God doesn't want you to die for him necessarily. He wants you to live for him. Put yourself on the altar and say, God, I'm yours every day. And it says it's your reasonable what? Service. Your reasonable service. And then he says, don't be like the world, but be transformed that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is called a life of dedication. So we go to God and we say, God, I'm not going to be a church, Sunday morning only church member. I'm not just going to go to church one hour a week and that's all I do for you. I am going to dedicate my life to you. Every day of my life, I'll put myself on the altar as a living sacrifice and say, God, I am yours today. I want to dedicate my life to you. These five strong reasons. Listen, do we really want America to be saved? Do we really want the mess that we have to be fixed. Do we want America to be better than what we are right now? Well, judgment begins at the house of God. God says, I'll, you don't have to live in fear. I'll be with you. You don't have to be discouraged about the election, about what's going on. He says, I'll strengthen you, I'll help you, and I'll lift you up by my righteousness. But by the way, before I do any of it, he says, produce your strong reasons. Give me some strong reasons for me to do it. God, We'll listen to you. We'll obey you. We will care about the things of God. We will stand against evil. And we will dedicate our lives to you. Now, you know what? Everybody in this room can do those five things. Do we really want America to be saved enough to do it? Or are we just going to say, well, this is just the... The hand we've been given, this is the way it is. And I'm sorry for our children and grandchildren have to grow up in this, but, you know, just kind of the way it is. Nothing we can do about it. Or do you think there is something we can do about it? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I sure do love you, Lord. I love these people. I'm so grateful that they came to church tonight. I'm so grateful for everybody who watched online. Lord, I just pray that you bless them. Bless all of us. Oh, God, help us. I'm disheartened. I was disappointed. I'm, I'm actually quite terrified about the prospect of the future of America without you involved. God, please do something great in our land. But, Lord, help us to, <coughs> help us to realize that we need to produce some strong reasons. 
so that you'll do it. Our heads about, our eyes are closed. Let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you are here tonight? You'd say, preacher, one or more of those five points, God clearly spoke to me, spoke to my heart. There's something that he wants me to do or something he specifically spoke to me about. Would you please pray for me that I do what he said? Would you raise your hand? Preacher, pray for me. Many, many hands. Wonderful, wonderful, tender-hearted people. You can lower your hands. Those of you online, if God spoke to you, please do whatever God said. Let me ask you another question. How many of you are here tonight? You're a child, a teenager, or an adult, and you'd simply, nobody's looking but me and God, but you'd simply say, Pastor, if I died tonight, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to go to heaven, but I sure want to be. I want to be saved. I want to know for sure that heaven is my home. If you're here tonight and you'd say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I'd like to be saved. Would you please remember me in prayer? I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Preacher, that's me. I need to be saved. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? Preacher, pray for me. All right, God bless you. Someone else, preacher, pray for me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for every person that raised their hands tonight. Lord, you saw the people, dozens of people, that raised their hands and said you spoke to them. Lord, whatever it is you spoke to them about, Lord, please help them to respond with obedience. Those among us that need to be saved, Lord, no better night than tonight to get saved. There's no reason to put it off. You're ready to save anybody. Help them to get saved tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? The pianist will begin to play. If God spoke to your heart, if you want to come pray at the altar, come pray at the altar. Let God have his way in your life this evening. We're just about done, but let's do business with God before.